السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسوله الأمين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد So Muslims and health and you know health problems are increasing people are being diagnosed with more and more illnesses every year and it's interesting that people are getting sick from eating and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created food so that we can get nutrients out of it so it can improve our health so it can give us energy so how can it be that something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put on earth to improve our health is actually damaging our health and the plans of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala never backfire so that means then that the problem must be from the way we're consuming food and the amounts of food that we're consuming so what we're consuming and how much we're consuming in Surah Al-A'raf in the Quran, verse number 31, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the middle of the verse says, وَكُلُوا وَاشْرَبُوا وَلَا تُسْرِفُوا إِنَّهُ لَا يُحِبُّ الْمُسْرِفِينَ And eat and drink and do not go in excess. Verily, Allah does not love those who excess, who overdo it. Imam Ibn Al-Qayyim, rahimahullah, he comments about this verse, and he says, all of a person's health, good health, are in these few divine words. This great Imam is saying all of your good health is in just these few divine words. وَكُلُوا وَاشْرَبُوا وَلَا تُسْرِفُوا Eat and drink and do not excess, do not go overboard. So that means then, perhaps the first problem is how much we're eating. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not design our bodies to consume all the kinds of food and the amounts of food that we're consuming right now. For example, biologically, you only need to eat meat once a week. Your body does not need meat more than once a week. But we eat meat every single day of the week. And sometimes more than once a day. And we're offended if there's no meat at the table. So what happens? We were not designed to consume so much meat. And the result of this overconsumption, we get all kinds of illnesses. Gout, for example. You get gout when you overdo, when you ex eat too much meat or too much seafood, or you consume drinks that have been sweetened with fructose. All these are things that could lead to people having gout. So we were not designed to consume that much. And Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam mentioned this in a hadith. This hadith, we all know it, and it's a very famous hadith. But we mention the hadith as if it's, the, it's mentioning the maximum. And this is the hadith where you eat and you, leave, you fill one third of your stomach with food one-third with drink, and then one-third you leave it for air. We mentioned the hadith like this is the, the minimum, uh, or like the maximum, really, yani minimum, yeah? So we mentioned as if this is the minimum you should do. But uh, we never quote the hadith from the beginning. The hadith begins when an Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, مَا مَلَأَ أَبْنُ آدَمْ وِعَاءً شَرًّا مِّن بَطْنِهِ The human being, son of Adam, male, female, has not filled any vessel. There's no container that you can fill worse than your stomach meaning the worst thing you can fill is your stomach hasb ibn adam luqaymat yuqimna sulba sufficient for the son of adam are a few bites to sustain him just a few bites to keep you going fa in kana wa la bud if there is no other way and you have to then fa thuluthun li ta'ami wa thuluthun li sharabi wa thuluthun so then a third for your food, then a third for your drink, and then a third for the air. So the hadith is mentioning this as the maximum that you can do. The maximum you can do. We mention it as if it's the minimum. Yeah, just start with that. No, that's the end. If you have to, there's no other way. Is that how much we consume now? Is that how we eat? How many of us today eat just a few bites to keep us going? Basically, you eat to remain alive. You eat to live. But what happens? We live to eat all we talk about is cuisine and watch cooking shows and watch eating shows and eating competitions just about eating 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 and this is not how much we were we were intended to consume it's too much and so as a result of that all kinds of illnesses arise we're supposed to consume just a little bit to contain us but we eat so much and if there is just a little bit of air left in our stomach we become uncomfortable and we search everywhere for a grape, a banana, something to fill that little gap with. So, we get ill because we overdo the amounts of food that we eat. You know, now there is an increase in people that are being diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. 
and it tells you that one out of every three children will be diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. How do you get type 2 diabetes? Type 1, we all know it. Type 1, where basically your immune system destroys the beta cells. These are the cells in your pancreas that create insulin, produce insulin. Type 1 diabetes, your body destroys these cells. In type 2, these cells are overworked and fatigued, and that's why they die off. Beta cells, that create insulin. So basically, when you consume any amount of food, glucose goes into your bloodstream. That's the energy from this food in the form of glucose. It goes into your bloodstream. <laughs> Once glucose is in your bloodstream, now it needs to leave the bloodstream and go into your muscles, into the muscle tissue. But you can't do that without insulin. So the minute there's glucose in your bloodstream, the, 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 the pancreas basically starts to produce insulin. Insulin allows glucose to pass from your bloodstream into the muscles, so it's stored there for energy. So then these beta cells that produce the insulin in the pancreas, they start to die off because they're overworked and they're fatigued. What causes them to be overworked and fatigued? How many times and how often is glucose just running through our veins? Constantly, almost all the time. So how much sugar are we consuming? Allah Azawajal, did He design our pancreas to consume and to handle so much sugar? When you drink just a small can of Coke, how much sugar is in that? 39 grams. Okay, first of all, in America at least, we don't use grams. So why is the sugar mentioned in grams? Because people don't understand grams, so they don't know how much is in there. 39 grams in this small can of Coke, that is about seven and a half teaspoons of sugar. And if I put that much in a glass of water, if I just put two, three teaspoons of sugar in a glass of water, would you drink it? It's too much. If I put seven and a half, would you drink it? You know when you go and get the big gulp, it's full of Pepsi or what have you, and you consume it throughout the day? That has like the equivalent of 100 packets of sugar. Imagine you tear up 100 packets of sugar and you fill that big gulp. Would you, cons would you do that? Would you consume that? But we drink, sometimes we replace water with Coke and things like that. And you might be thinking juice is probably better. And when you read the label, you see 27 grams of sugar. In, in juice. So you think it's less than Coke. It's not. It's just that they, the serving size is smaller. But if you make it the same size as what's in a can of Coke, you have exactly 39 grams, exactly the same amount of sugar. Too much sugar. Our bodies were not designed for that. So perhaps then that's the first half of the problem. We're eating far too much. We're eating far beyond what we need. And this is causing damage to our body. That's why. Allah designed it to not cause us harm. It's supposed to do good for us, but it's doing bad because we're overdoing the amounts. Allah Azrael did not design our bodies to handle that much uh, of food. That's the first part of the problem then. The second possible part of the problem is what we're eating and the problems in what we eat. Either what we're eating is straight up harmful or, or it's just useless. Take orange juice for example. So now when they make orange juice, it's homogenized and it's pasteurized. When it's pasteurized, basically it's boiled at very high temperatures to kill the pathogens in this orange juice. Now you know when you squeeze an orange in your home and you put that juice in the fridge, if you don't drink it within a few days, what happens to it? It ferments. It goes bad immediately. But you buy the, the carton of orange juice and it's been sitting in the supermarket shelf maybe for a whole week. You take it and you open it and you drink from it for another week and a half and it still doesn't go bad because it's been pasteurized, it's been boiled and every pathogen in it has been killed. This is, and, and it's stripped of the oxygen that's in it. This is a process known as deaeration. So it does not oxidize, it doesn't go bad. And because it doesn't go bad, sometimes it's stored in gigantic containers at the juice place, the juice factory. For over a year it sits like that. And in this year it loses all its flavor. So then they, they hire another company that will engineer what is known as flavor packets, okay? Other chemicals and other things that will, they pour into this juice that's been sitting for a year to make it taste fresh, like it was just squeezed off a Florida orange tree yesterday. And you consume that. Then in the process of pasteurization, the high heat kills the vitamin that's in the orange juice. So they can tell you vitamin C with vitamin C. And you drink it and there is vitamin C in it, but it's all dead because it was killed. It's all useless to your body. But they're not lying when they say with vitamin C because there is vitamin C in it. It's just dead vitamin C. You see? Or sometimes it says vitamin C added, which means because they know it's, there's no vitamin C, they added vitamin C after that process. So 
<laughs> so a little better, but still not good. So what's the best thing? The best thing, you squeeze your own juice. That's the best thing you can do. The truth is, there are two golden rules here, right? Number one, if anything, any food, if a man put their hand into it, it's bad. Just that's the general rule. Whatever people, human beings have meddled with, it's bad in some way or another or in the long term. The other thing is that nobody cares about you. Nobody. Not the government, not the Food and Drug Administration, not the medical industry. Nobody cares about you. The only one who cares about you is you, yourself. That's the only one who cares. So you have to watch out for these things. They're not going to warn you. So this is just a simple example with vitamin C. With meat, we have all kinds of problems. They, put, they add sodium nitrate to meat as a preservative. Where do we put sodium nitrate? It's a component that's found in fertilizers. Right? It's also used in pyrotechnics like fireworks. It's used to make smoke bombs. And it's also used as a rocket propellant. Then it's also used as a, preser as a meat preserver. Now, I don't want to hear that something that can be used in smoke bombs will be put in my meat as well. And sodium nitrite, nitrite and nitrate. Both of them are put in the meat. Sodium nitrate, it also prevents bad bacteria from growing and making the food spoil, the meat spoil. Now, sodium nitrite, it basically reacts with the, the amino or the myoglobin in the meat. The myoglobin, this is basically the, the iron and an oxygen binding protein that's found in muscle tissue. Basically, it's the ability of the muscle to hold oxygen, which is very important. So, it reacts with this, and, and basically that's why when you walk into the supermarket, you find if you ever looked at pork, it's light pink, and then beef, it's darker, because beef has more myoglobin. All right? and, the, and tuna, for example, also when you cook it, it turns dark, while other meat, the fish, is white, because there's more myoglobin in tuna, because it's constantly swimming, so it needs to hold more oxygen. So this basically binds with the nitrites, and it makes it look bright red. That's why when you go to the supermarket, the meat looks very fresh, bright red. Now, when you buy meat from your local butcher and you put it in your fridge for a few days, it gets brown. But this meat for weeks in the fridge here looks bright red because of this reaction between the sodium nitrite and the, uh, the, uh, the myoglobin in the meat. So it looks fresh, but it could be very, very old and supposed to be very, very brown. And then you find discussions about these nitrates and nitrites causing cancer. But any time you find something causing cancer, oh, it's disputed. Oh, we're not exactly sure. Because the, the food industry, they have their own research and they cast their own doubts into these issues. So who do you believe then? And then both of them, the, the sodium nitrate, sodium nitrite, are converted into <coughs> nitrosamines, which are known to cause cellular degeneration and to damage DNA uh, any molecules or uh, cause DNA damage. So this is a problem. There's always something wrong with the food. If human beings have meddled with it, there's something wrong with it. For, with cattle, we have problems with estrogen. So they give them this female hormone, estrogen, and so the cows gain weight and their meat is tender and soft. But what is the problem with estrogen? Nothing destroys it. If you boil the meat, broil the meat, fry the meat, cook the meat, whatever you do with it, it still remains in the meat. If you milk a cow that's been given estrogen, the estrogen is in the milk. If you make yogurt from that milk, it's in the yogurt. If you make cheese from that milk, it's in the cheese. It's a female hormone that we don't want in our bodies. We're getting more and more of it. Cows now are milked 300 days out of the year. Even when they're pregnant, they're milked. And when they're pregnant, certain components or estrogen type components increased by 33 times in the milk. And they just milk it and then they give it to us and we consume it. There was a study that was done in 42 countries to see, to find a correlation between dairy consumption and testicular cancer. And they found the, the strongest correlation to be in Switzerland and in Denmark, where cheese is one of the national foods and people consume a lot of dairy. They found the lowest relationship to be in Algeria, where people don't consume as much dietary like, uh, or, or dairy products. So you see then problems all over the place. People engineering food, adding things to food, doing crazy things to food. Mercury, fish. You think of fish, you think of mercury. There's always a problem somewhere. And almost none of the processes is natural anymore. Tomatoes, they're picked green. They don't pick them when they're ripe. They pick them when they're green and still hard so they don't go bad. And then they ripen them by putting them in ethane gas. 
and then that gets them to turn red. So they're not damaged and they look good to you, the consumer. So the answer then, if you can buy organic, eat organic. Decrease the amount of food that you eat. You don't need to eat that much of anything. Find out, play around and examine, find out exactly how much you need. And if you can grow, of course, grow and be very aware, read, be very conscious of what you're consuming, what you're putting into your bodies. Zakum Allah khairan for your attentive listening. Sallallahu wa barakatuh. Muhammad wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.